and yo señores. First, I would like to thank um, the invitation from Galvan, from Miguel Reiter, and Milton Vieira, and from the organizing committee for inviting me to come and make a presentation for you. And I will say that my slides will be in Portuguese, in top, and English in parentheses. And I will ask you to please forgive any errors in the Portuguese translation because I use Microsoft Word. <laughs> and that will help me correct some of them. But hopefully you can follow because we have it in both English and Portuguese. Well, I was asked to talk about the instrumentations that are used to measure soil physical properties. And there are so many that I'm going to touch on just some of them. And hopefully, uh, if you have questions about others, then we can uh, talk about those during the question and answer period. I'm going to uh, talk about the outline of the presentation. First, we will have an introduction, and then uh, following the introduction, I'm going to do sort of an overview of the methods that are uh, more than what I'm going to cover in detail. And then we'll talk about sort of temperature, water, content, and potential of pressure. And the reason I say potential and pressure because we're going to talk about groundwater as well as uh, water in the soil. So uh, we will talk about pressure. And I can talk about pressure from a positive standpoint and a negative standpoint. And the negative in the potential or the negative potential in the soil. After that, we will talk about home penetration measurements and soil electrical properties. It's just a little bit about EM38. But there are many other electrical properties that we will talk about. But one we will focus on will be time domain reflectometry, TDR. And then ground penetrating radar, we will touch on a little bit as well. And I'm going to finish with a map, a 3D mapping of a soil using cone penetrometer and other methods. And then from that, we will do a conclusion. So by way of introductions, let's start by talking about the instrumentation focus that I will make. I will make the focus on real time more so than others. So that will be the primary focus, meaning that we will look at in situ kind of measurements, more so than measurements where you collect and take a sample to the field. We will have some of that, but we will do more in situ. Because I think it's very important that when we make measurements of the soil, we measure the soil in the natural state. Because when we take a sample, it's a small sample, and it may not be as representative as what we find in the field. Therefore, it's important to make in situ measurements. And one other thing that I'm going to do is finish on using a laser to measure soil but the example I'm going to show is from the Mars rover, and that is for chemical measurements because I want to speculate that this is the direction that we should go in soil science. We should be thinking ahead, and I like your uh, theme about what is soil about and who is it for. So I think that when we look at this, we will understand that we can bring soil to the forefront. If we can put a rover on Mars to measure rock properties, surely we can have a similar kind of technique to measure soil. And this would be the kind of thing necessary for spatial variability, mapping of soil, but also for farming, site-specific farming. So I'm going to finish up by talking on that. So the institute measurements, one of the things I want to talk about when I talk about the in-situ measurements is that we should be measuring by soil depth. 
because that's all the easy way to do it, because that's where the models go. But I think that we shouldn't solely go by just depth, like every five centimeters, or every 10 centimeters, but we should focus by horizon. We should appreciate soil genesis and the fact that the soil was formed in different horizons and we have a reason for selecting the different horizons and that we should make our measurements by horizon. So we can still do depth, but depth within those horizons. Because I think it's important, and that's why we have the diagnostic horizons, and therefore we should make measures within those diagnostic horizons. Another focus I would like to say is that we shouldn't be focusing in small areas, but we should be looking at a landscape scale. And so that's why I have a landscape down here, because I think that we need to fully understand soils on the landscape, as opposed to just a soil pit and taking measures from one single area. And so you will see that when I finish, we will be looking at a small landscape, but we will nonetheless be looking at soil from a landscape scale. Okay, so by way of introduction, the uh, start, I'm gonna talk about real-time investigation with soil temperature, for example, um, heat flux, water content, and I put evaporation, but we know that we are generally concerned about evapotranspiration, but since we're talking about soil, we'll talk about evaporation. And these are some of the old but very um, traditional methods for measuring things in soil, but there are other things that we can learn and pick from those uh, other than just looking at temperature, and I will talk a bit about that. So soil temperature, the simple and easy way to measure that is with um, thermocouples. And there are various other resistance thermometers, and there's so many of those, I'm just going to touch on it, but I'm going to come back and show some data and talk about how we might extract more than just temperature from the data that we receive uh, by measuring that. And heat flux, we can measure <coughs> with this with a data logger now, fairly simple, by using thermal electric coolers. Water flow in soil, we can do quite a sophisticated measurements with pan lysimeters, and I won't talk a lot about that. We've done a considerable amount of work with porous stainless steel pan lysimeters, and they are quite accurate. We make them fairly large, one um, a half a meter by 30 centimeters. And so we can sample a large area. So again, that in situ kind of a measurement where we can do measurements, where we can capture the flow in a macro pore. If we put a small sample, or we take a small sample, we cannot capture the flow in a macro pore. So evaporation, again, if we know with a pan lysimeter, the water flow in the soil, we can back calculate for evaporation and evapotranspiration from the soil. So the pan lysimeter is very important, but again, I'm not going to uh, focus on that uh, very much. The soil water content, I will focus on using time domain reflectometry, but I will start by saying we can still use gypsum blocks. We know that they have errors associated with them. Uh, with uh, nylon uh, resistant cells. Again, they have errors associated with them uh, based on the fact that uh, the soil uh, chemistry will affect the reading. But with gypsum blocks, we know that they dissolve all the time, so they have a problem. But time domain plectometry is the new development. A uh, former student in Wisconsin, Clark Top, who was in Canada, uh, was the one who brought that to the forefront. And it's now a fairly well accepted method for measuring water content. And you can buy uh, the probes as well as the um, reading devices from a lot of vendors. So they're available all over the world. Soil water pressure, and again, I say pressure because I'm going to focus on some groundwater measuring using a pressure transducer. And I'm going to talk a bit about a pressure transducer. Uh, and some of the publications we did early on 
with a pressure transfer so connected to a tensiometer. And then I'll finish with some penetrometer work that we've been doing and uh, cone penetrometer data and properties and the 3D uh, modeling. I won't say much more about that because uh, we'll focus on that quite a bit. But let me start by saying that we don't always have to go for the most sophisticated and high-tech techniques to understand some of the things that are going on when we start looking at large scale in the soil of, and the soil plant interaction. Because the plant is a very good integrator of what's going on in the soil. So if we take a look at the plant and what is going on there, we will find a lot about what's in the soil. And I show this slide. What it is is a golf course in New Jersey. And they have sandy soil. And this golf course actually has hydrophobic soils. So hydrophobicity is a real problem there. And what you will see is that on the left side, the real green area there, I'll see if my laser can point to it, this green globe. Okay. I'll see if I can push the button in the, in the center. Okay, this green area is where a surfactant has been placed. The uh, superintendent sprayed one half of the golf course with a surfactant. And a surfactant is a uh, surface active chemical that basically changes the uh, surface tension for water and make the water then infiltrate that. And so on the left side, so on the right side is the uh, area that's been sprayed. The left side is an area that has not been sprayed. And what you can see is the patchy uh, green areas, and some areas are a lot greener than others. You see the dry areas. And just a simple photograph is what I want to show is that you can determine this. So there are a lot of things we can do by just taking simple photographs. Prior to the uh, U.S. Army using drones, we uh, in the 1980s started using model airplanes to take photographs of soil. And so by using model airplane and photographs, you can see a lot about what the plant is telling you about the soil. And so these plants are telling me I'm happy on the side where I'm green because the water is infiltrating. On the other side, the water is not infiltrating. It's sitting there evaporating off, it's not getting into the soil. So that's one way that we can reduce a lot by just doing simple things. It might not be able to produce the kind of data that we need to do one of the statistics, but nonetheless it gives you a direction now where to go and set your plots up. So you can now design experiments to go out and then better place your monitoring devices. So that's starting out with some of the simple things. Now let's get to more sophisticated kinds of things. This is a um, diurnal fluctuation of different tillage system with corn. <coughs> So on the x-axis we have temperature, uh, excuse me, on the y-axis we have temperature, and on the x-axis we have time, consecutive hours. And you can see the classic diurnal fluctuation in temperature over a day, over those three days that we have the measures here. The treatments, the CN is conventional tillage, which means it was mobile or plow. The TP is a till plant, which means that it was a, what we would consider now as zone tillage. And the CH is for chisel. And you understand chisel deep plowing uh, to the depth of about 20 centimeters or so. And then the very last one, NT, is no tillage. So it's zero tillage. And this work we were focusing on in Wisconsin. We, uh, I'll show you a slide later on. I think sometime the glacier come back to visit us. So it's very cold there. And the soils are very cold, and you'll see some slides later on where you'll probably agree that the glacier is still there. Um, but what we were doing was trying to figure out the problem of cold soil with no tillage. And so you'll see that the no tillage is the lowest line there, so it's the colder soil. The top line is the conventional, it's the warmer soil. And so these are thermocouple measurements with a data logger, and we can determine a lot more, as I said, about this 
other than temperature, if we take a look at this graph, which shows temperature on the left and time, excuse me, temperature on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. And so what we've done is sum the um, average daily temperature over time. So if we start at 113, day 113, where zero would be the, the uh, or one would be the first day of January. And you can see that we have values that go up, and then you'll notice they collapse back down. We start over again, go up, collapse back down. What's happening is that, as I say, you can get more than just temperature by looking at temperature data, is that those are rain events. So when it rains, you got something that has a very high heat capacity that's coming into the soil, infiltrating into the soil, changing the temperature. And so what we were trying to do is look at heating trends and calculating the amount of heat that was entering the soil. But we noticed these interruptions. So it would rain, we'd start over. Heat again, it would rain, we'd start over. So from the temperature data, I can get an understanding about water flow in the soil. And so that's why I say if you take a real close look at analyzing your data, you will find more about what's going on than just what you were actually trying to measure. And I didn't anticipate being able to do this, but we could then map wetting plots by looking at temperature changes. Along the same line in this study, there is a need to understand how fast the corn emerge. Because, as I said, it's cold temperature in the soil, so the corn does not emerge rapidly. And so this slide shows on the y-axis emerges over time up to 100%. On the x-axis, it has days after planting. And what I want to make a pitch for is that at the time that I was doing this work back in the 80s, I wasn't thinking much about how we might measure things. So I had a student. And uh, students, you will appreciate this. His job was to go out every day and count the amount of corn plants that emerged. I see some heads nodding that you can relate to that. And so the first year, 1982, you see there, he didn't get his data because he went out too late. The corn had all emerged. The next year, he and I had a discussion in my office, door closed. Then he went back out, and he went out three times a day, and he got the day. And you can see the emergence over time. And you can see the difference between the different treatments. And in the last year, which would have been 1984, he did an even better job. But the point I want to make about this is that, hey, I've been thinking before about doing a measure with a, some sort of device. There are some devices I could have used, but they are available to us more now than they were then. And one would be just to take a camera and record it. Just leave the camera there, focus on the plot, and let the camera record this and process it with, uh, if we couldn't see the corn coming up, we could use infrared. And we certainly could see it as it emerged. Uh, that's one thing. And the other one, if we want to look at the plant growth, because later on he was looking at plant growth, whereby he was measuring the height of the corn. Again, we can use a camera for that nowadays. But another thing that we could use is a linear voltage device, whereby we attach the LBD to the leaf of the camera, and it will be in as the corn plant grows, the voltage will change and you will actually get the height of the corn. So, and that has been done uh, by uh, actually my professor at Oregon State, uh, Larry Warsman, uh, that was done. So, these are other kind of simple methods that could be used now to uh, collect the data that, that we were trying to collect. Now I'm going to move to water content, and the slide here shows testing was placed at two different depths in the soil. One's at 15 centimeters, one is at 37 centimeters, and we have a pressure transducer attached to those. 
And what I'm going to show you is some data from that, and you'll see some really interesting kind of results by doing this type of measurement. And we connect the pressure transducer to a data logger and record the pressure over time. And you can collect these data at any time interval that you want. We were collecting at 15 minute intervals. And so the lines there show the pressure in the soil at the 37 centimeter depth and at 15 centimeter depth. The bar, the wide bar at the top is rainfall in millimeters. So we have soil pressure in kilopascals and we have rainfall in millimeters. And what you will see is particularly the bottom line, which is the 15 centimeter reading, and I have 10 on there, but it should be 15. That, oh no, that's the pressure, uh, uh, 10 centimeters of water pressure, sorry, and one kilopascal. That was where it's saturated. So if you see the red line indicating one kilopascal, and that's why I say I prefer talking about positive pressure, negative pressure, so I, you'll see that this is labels such the negative pressures in the bottom, positive pressure in the top. Because in the soil, when you look at by horizon, and that's why I say we should look by horizon, so we put these at the center of the A, P horizon, so that's the uh, 15 centimeter one, and the 37 is at the center of the B horizon. So that soil actually saturated with this large rain unit. And so we ended up with 50 centimeters of positive pressure in the deeper one and about 10 centimeters in the second one. And then we can look at that soil as a drain over time. And you can see some interesting things. When you see the dip in the line, that's indicating during the day, the plant is taking the water out. There's a corn plant in here. And you can see uh, as the plant needs to take water out, you'll see a dip in the 15 centimeter reading. A small dip in the first one at about day 175. And if you look at day 176, the next day, there was a much larger dip, which means that the plant now is taking more water out and there's less water there for it to take out, so it's sucking more water out. Now you start to see a little bit of a dip in the 37 centimeters, which means that water is now flowing up to that zone. And then you look at the last dip there at 177, there's a tremendous amount of water that's now being sucked out by the plants. And then you get some relief by having another rain event. So you see the bar there at one, after 177, smaller rain than the first rain. So we didn't get the positive pressure build up in the soil, but we do get it coming back. So if you maintain the tensiometers properly, you can get considerable amount of data on plant growth and what's going on in the soil. But again, I would emphasize the fact that by placing this in the diagnostic horizon, it's better than had I placed that at five centimeters, 10 centimeters. But knowing something about the horizon give you a bit more. The next one I would like to talk about is water content measurements. And what we have here, and I apologize that this is a rather busy slide, um, but we were trying to measure water content in a potato field. And so the slide at the bottom, uh, the picture at the bottom, shows you how the TDR was placed. We, I'll see if I can do this without disturbing the things. We here, cut a hole in the row and place the time domain reflectometers in in the row and then we put back the soil and put back the um, plant. We actually took the plant out, kept it alive, and then put it back. And we have this on a two different systems. One is a sprinkling irrigation and the other one is a uh, drip irrigation. And what I want to show with the lines, if you look at the drip irrigation, you will see that there's quite a bit what looked to be noise. But this is basically that showing that every time we irrigate, we can see the water movement through the profile. 
With a sprinkle irrigation, you don't see as much of this. And the difference is that, go back to the slide that I showed you about the golf course and the hydrophobicity of the soil. When we grow crops on our sandy soils in Wisconsin, the central part of the state, we have a hydrophobic problem. And so that soil becomes hydrophobic over time and it will not wet back up. And so again, this is where we can use surfactant to solve that problem. But the problem is the fact that we have a large sand grain and the sand grain is coated with organic material. And that organic material, when it dries out, a hydrophobic end turns out. And when that hydrophobic end turns out, soil will not wet back up. But if you put a surfactant on it, then you will be able to wet it back up. But with the drip irrigation, it was never drying out because you always place the water right where the root needed. And it was always working. So uh, that's some really interesting kind of information. And this was the first that we discovered of the hydrophobic condition in this crop was by this measurement. And we didn't know that before that. We talked to the farmers, they apparently knew it, but they didn't ask or didn't know how to take care of the problem. And once we found this, then we were able to do the same kind of thing that the golf course people were able to do, and we could actually go out and solve that problem for the farmers by looking at our data. So again, when you ask the question about who are you doing your research for, if you solve some of the problems and then you talk to the farmers, you can find that there's a common ground, if you will, uh, you can now help them solve a problem that you didn't anticipate when you started your research. So another problem that I'm going to talk about in Wisconsin now is, uh, and this is in the same area that um, we found the hydrophobic soil, the central part of the state is a sand. And this Wisconsin was glaciated, and so it's kind of maybe kind of difficult to see, but this side where it looked like ridges is the um, unglaciated area. The Midwest of, of the U.S., and here's the U.S. down here, and I show Wisconsin, uh, it's located in Canada and down uh, into um, Central America. But the Midwest is glaciated. But there's an island of unglaciated area in Wisconsin, Minnesota here, Iowa, and Illinois. And that's long slopes with uh, silty soils on highly erosive soils. In the center part of the state was a large lake when the soils were formed, and this is where our sandy soils are. So that's what I'm going to show here. The water table is very high there. Up until 2005 or 2006, and I think this is a result of climate change, there's a debate between scientists as to what's really going on. But um, you can see that the yellow dots indicate centipedic irrigation. And the centipedic irrigation is in this same area. Back in the 70s, the geologists had theorized that if we keep pumping water to grow crops the way we were doing and increasing the number of high capacity wells of irrigation, that we would dry up the aquifer. And so what I will show you is this was a lake. You can see that there's a dock there that goes nowhere, goes out, there's no water anymore. That lake is now dry. And the local people, particularly the ones who live around the lake, there are 97 homes around this lake. They purchased lakefront property, which is no longer lakefront property. So you can imagine their uh, concern about what's going on. And this is one of many lakes that have gone dry in the past 10 years in Wisconsin because of irrigation and pumping and water. And what I think is happening is that climate has changed. We can now grow a crop in that area, we can actually double crop in that area. Whereas in the past, we only grow one crop. We have two additional weeks of growing in the spring, two additional weeks in the fall because of global climate change. And if you think about global climate change, if it's warmer, particularly at night now, the farmers are having to irrigate more water in order to grow that crop. And by them increasing the amount of water put on the crop, this is why this lake is going dry. 
and just another view of that lake. And I'll have a final view showing you uh, this name of the lake is Long Lake. And it says that there should be no waste. In other words, there was enough water in here for the boats to go so fast that it would create a wave. Uh, I don't think there's a problem now. But that lake has gone dry. We have springs that have gone dry. And so we were doing some work to try and figure out what could be done to um, solve this problem. And what I show here is a photograph of the area with center pivots. And we had three sites, one with the pine trees, one with a um, corn crop with mixed vegetation, and one with, uh, with a prairie mixed vegetation, and another one with a prairie that you see there. And that has big blue stem on the left side, and on the right side is winter. I said I would show you some slides that you would think that uh, the uh, glacier is still in Wisconsin. So this left side is what the prairie looked like in spring and summer. The right side is what it looked like in winter. And so we're asking the question about groundwater recharge during winter. And this, again, is a study where we actually didn't anticipate what we found, but by monitoring very detailed measures, we were able to find what's going on. And I'm going to come back to this slide um, and talk about it later. So when we started trying to look at this, basically what we saw was that the water was changing, the water table was increasing in the prayer, but we didn't see as much of an increase in the um, corn field. And so what we did then was we went out with a ground penetrating radar to take measurements, and these are the results of the ground penetrating radar. And what you will see is that the top white line is for the prairie, and it's a frost depth. It's where the soil was frozen. The second one shows the white line, and that white line is down about I apologize, it's in the feet, two and a half feet. So it was much more frost, a much deeper frozen ground in the field. And the difference is because of the cover on the soil. And so we were trying to figure out, well, how is the best way to monitor this? So after we discovered that there was not much of a frost in, I said, well, simple. This is where the students come in again. We sent a student out with a hammer and a rod. Drive the water in the ground, you don't get frost, there's no frost. Real simple measurement. But we had put in groundwater monitoring wells. Some of you know Francisco Ariaga, and this is Francisco uh, and myself drilling wells into the field. And we monitored those over time with a pressure transducer in the groundwater to measure the pressure of the groundwater so we can then calculate the elevation of the groundwater over time. And these are the data from that. We had two um, storms that we were looking at. And the, looking at the water table in the winter, the first one was in 2008. We had rain on top of the snow. And you saw the other slide where we had all the snow and we were pulling the ground penetrating radar through it. And what happens is that you see an increase in the water table. We see a greater increase in the mixed prairie and in the grass prairie than we do in the corn for that first rain event. The second rain event, the second rain event is in December of the next year of 2009. And we see even greater differences there where the prairie, both prairies, had more water infiltrating, particularly than the uh, irrigated soybean. The um, corn that year seemed to show a little bit more of a, a difference than we had anticipated. But again, by monitoring the groundwater, we can see a lot about what's going on above the groundwater in vegetation. And further looking at this kind of study, we uh, can see that if you take a real close look, you see all of the changes where the rainfall is occurring in the 
pine plantation and the mixed vegetation and then the irrigated corn. But if you really look close, you see the pine plantation does not change. And what is happening is that the pine plantation is intercepting most of the water, and the water is not even getting to the soil. And when it gets to the soil, the little layer will absorb a quite a bit of it, and it all evaporates before it gets to the groundwater. So it doesn't recharge groundwater. So planting pine plantation in an area where we have a problem with the lake drying up is not helping us. But if we had prairie vegetation there, it would help. And so we have quite a few pine plantations planted around there. And I noticed that you have quite a few around um, here uh, outside of the city of Florinopolis. And so this is just a detailed showing of the groundwater over time. Now I'm going to talk about some data. Actually, these are data from Delvon Rand. He collected these data when he, were in, he was in uh, Wisconsin. And so uh, what I'm going to show is a cone penetrometer data. And you will see the cone penetrometer data that were collected when it was dry and cone penetrometer data that was collected when it was wet. And you'll see that the Penetration resistance order the same. In other words, they, they are in the same order, whether it was dry or wet. But you get quite a different profile when you measure when it's wet and when it was dry. So it's very important to, on um, measures like this, understand that you need to do them at field brush capacity or some other um, set water content so that you can make comparisons. And so the other thing that I'll point out here is that he was looking at compaction. And you can see that there is quite a bit of difference in compaction between the no tillage compared to the chisel. And he was looking at two different crops, but we won't um, talk so much about those. I'll talk about cone penetrometer now that we have been trying to develop for some time. We've had some success, but uh, not quite as, as well as we would like. And this is the cone penetrometer and time domain reflectometry built together. So the black part of that, which is difficult to see, but at the top of the cone is a, what's called derrick. It's a plastic. And then in the middle, we go to the metal again, and then at the bottom, we go to the metal again with the derrick in between it. And we can mimic in what a coaxial cable looks like. And we can actually measure water content as we do our cone penetration. So while it's important to know the water content of cone penetration, we can actually develop a device where we can measure it at the same time. And these data show a, a comparison where the TDR measurement over the depth is in green, and in red are soil pores that we took for the um, water content. And so on the other side, then we show the cone penetration resistance, and we actually then had the cone penetrometer, so that's the cone penetrometer TDR. You can see that, particularly at the bottom, they agree quite well. At the top, uh, not so well. Uh, I'm not sure uh, why, uh, but we did quite a bit of measures with this. And the problem that we found in further developing it is that to make the cone and make it um, rather strong the way you can use it continuously uh, was, is difficult. It's a difficult measurement, uh, difficult thing to put together. So, uh, But we're still working on that. Now I'm going to go through uh, another example with mapping with a cone penetrometer. And our objective was to develop a three-dimensional map over a large area. And so this is an example of the three-dimensional map that we were able to produce using cone penetrometer measurements. And Sabina Grunwald, uh, some of you may have seen her talk yesterday on um, education, distance education, uh, worked with us on this work as well. And so what you can see here is that we were able to identify glacial seal, till sediment, lacustrine sediment, all with a cone penetrometer, and then come up with a three-dimensional map of the soil so you can see the soil space variability. Then uh, what you can do is relate that back to the digital elevation. And so what this shows is a digital elevation model of that of an area that I will talk about a bit more later. And we were able to identify three different soil types from the um, cone penetrometer. And so this is the cone penetrometer that we were using. It is mounted on the truck. And 
we collect the data with a data logger and with a uh, load sailor. So this is some of the data uh, showing an area, and we talk, I, I said we look at a two-dimensional map and we look at a three-dimensional map. So the two-dimensional map is shown here, and we have the cone penetration resistance over that area at the bottom. And the way we map this is that we look at the um, scatter of the data for the cone penetrometer, and we basically use statistics to lump them together. And you can see the area where the blue dots are all pretty much look the same. And so we know that that's all the same soil type. And then you can see where we have the white dots, the green dots that kind of come together. And we said this is the same soil type. And these were taken on 10 meter grids. And these are the uh, results from those 10 meter grids where again we can put together the different layers and we can then look at the different soil types and have a spatial variability of the um, soil in that area. EM38, uh, we also made measures with that. It's not quite as refined when you start looking at the salt as a uh, cone penetrometer. So we took a look at this and then we said, okay, we can't map this quite as well, so we go back to the cone penetrometer. And here the uh, cone penetrometer again with a 3D map that we were generating from it. And in addition, what we do is that we get our pedology friends out and have them to map the horizons. And so you can see the different horizons there as well. And we can then relate that back using our statistics and creepy to come up with our soil grouping from the cone index reading. To look further at this map, so I now have the um, EM38 compared to the uh, cone penetrometer, and we have the big area in the red, it's all the same soil type in cluster one. We have soils clustered in cluster two, and you see a little bit of elevation here where on the um, green there's a small area, and then there's an area up at the top to the right that is green as well. That's a cluster. Two and plus the three then is on the highest elevation. So we map all those soils as being different from that standpoint. And so this is a close-up then showing the standard deviation around the uh, cone index for cluster one for cluster three. And this is the same thing for cluster two, and you can see at the bottom there's quite a bit of difference in the cone index reading compared to uh, cluster one, where it's a little bit small standard deviation at the bottom, but when we go to cluster two, we have a large standard deviation, so we know that we are making the correct kind of mapping. And then we go to cluster one, it's completely different from both of those. And so that's how we've been able to map soil based on the cone penetration resistance through the profile. And then we take that and put it together and look at geo layers. And so we can come up with these different layers. And so here's a then starting on the 3D rendition of that, but it also shows the cone index in kilopascals. And so you can see that the red areas where the high cone index is. And when we measure the soil, go out and look at the profile, that's the same. And so that works out. This is uh, where we look at different layers by putting uh, a spear of the cone index throughout the profile and further mapping. And so just to conclude from that, we found that using our statistics, we were ro it was robust enough to allow us to do a classification so we can understand the borders between uh, the different clusters, and we can then develop a three-dimensional map from this, and we can look at the uniformity of the spatial variability of the cone index. And we also were able to identify an eroded area from that. And so the second part of this would be then to characterize the soil further by using the transect. And so we did transects through the field, line transects of the area, and then again we do the mapping of the uh, profile from soil genesis, just showing uh, three different areas, this is five through six, and here's a large area, the uh, flat area through the field. And then the other thing we did was the particle size distribution. 
using the laser, and I'll come back to that. So there's one spot there showing that. And so this is the laser that we use for analysis of the soil particle size, and I will not uh, play with that. So the other thing is that um, we were able to go through different parts of the field, collect the sample, because the laser can measure so rapidly, we can measure particle size distribution within one minute. We can collect a lot of samples and we can get some good readings with that. And so we developed the results from that, go back to three-dimensional, and we can then compare that to our other readings. And what I want to show is that the laser may not be the best. We actually have a problem with the sand. Well, no problem with sand, but we have a little bit of a problem with the silk, with an overestimation of, excuse me, of the clay. An overestimation of the clay. And that's typical. We found a way around that by measuring sand and silk and getting the clay by difference. And it works quite well. Uh, we did that after we completed this study. The last part I want to talk about is hydraulic conductivity. And we use a um, in situ measurement again to measure hydraulic conductivity of saturated soil with uh, a musometer. It was developed by a soil physicist, a musogar, who was in North Carolina, in the US. And we did site measurements. And we were able to then plot on the landscape scale the hydraulic conductivity. And you can see from three centimeters per hour down to uh, 10 to the minus two centimeters per hour that we can plot on that. And the last thing I want to uh, finish with is soil erosion. By doing the same three-dimensional kind of things, we can look at soil carbon, because that's a very uh, uh, hot topic these days. Uh, we're looking at soil carbon, and we can relate soil carbon back to soil erosion, and we can develop a three-dimensional map of that and overlay the soil carbon percent of the AP horizon over this, uh, so you can see that. So, by way of conclusion, I think that there are a lot of methods out there, particularly rapid methods for determining soil particle size with a laser that we need more work on. That's going to be important. Uh, and I think it's important to do real-time measurements. And what I want to finish with is one last one, is a laser with chemical analysis. And the reason I want to finish with this is because this is an example of the Mars rover. And the Mars rover is actually measuring the chemical composition of the rocks in Mars using a laser. And soil scientists have now started doing some of this, but the neat thing that I think has yet to come, and that's where future type measures we can do, would be to actually take this similar to the Mars rover to the field. I think in agriculture we should be to the forefront as the astronauts are, and we should be able to take what has been developed here at Lawrence Livermore Laboratory and do chemical analysis on the go, if you will, in the field, in situ, and develop again further mapping and understanding about soil using a laser technique. So uh, with that, I will take questions if they have time.